Good morning, good afternoon, hello everyone. Um, I am Mirsad Kriyashtras and I am joining you from South Florida. I'm senior researcher at the Bratislava-based Minority Issues Research Institute, which is also known by our acronym of MIRI. Our institute is dedicated to uh, working towards promoting and protecting human rights and human and minority rights in Slovakia and abroad. And for that reason today, we are going to focus on our home our country of Slovakia and talk about an important uh, subject, which uh, the director of our institute have uh, researched and published recently. Um, <clears throat> we believe in the importance of research, education, and active involvement in shaping a more just society. And as a part of our <clears throat> activities, we hold these monthly or weekly conversations with experts and people regarding various issues that can, can affect political developments in regions and countries around the world, and certainly that can affect the developments around the minorities of all kinds. And so for that reason, today we have <clears throat> um, our director, Dr. Svetlusha Surova, presenting on targeting marginalized Roma communities in Slovakia. She will explain her analysis of the official measures during the COVID-19 pandemic in Slovakia, and we are sure that this same uh, uh, or similar issues were happening throughout uh, with various types of minorities. Um, the event today will be, uh, how you say, hosted by Abel uh, Ravas. He is a former government, government um, official involved in basically trying to assist Roma communities. So he's definitely well versed in uh, the issue and we are very honored and proud to have him today with us to host this event. And uh, as usual, we are, we are going to have a presentation first and after the presentation, um, we are welcome to get your questions and, and we will try to answer them to the best of our ability. Uh, please, when you're asking questions, turn on your microphone and introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from, and then ask your questions. In case you cannot uh, ask your question by microphone, you're welcome to type in your question and we'll try to read them for you, and hopefully Dr. Sero will be able to answer them. And so without a delay, we will uh, like to start, so I will please take over. Hello again, uh, Mirsad. Uh, thank you for having me at today's event. I'm very happy that uh, we are joined by so many people today from all parts of the world, but also from Slovakia, which is the country that we are going to be focusing on today. As you may or may not know, during the COVID pandemic in Slovakia from 2020, there have been a number of targeted measures uh, uh, that were specifically um, um, employed um, for and against the Roma communities in Slovakia. The Roma in Slovakia very often live in poor conditions, in concentrated housing neighborhoods and segregated uh, Roma settlements. So therefore, the government had this understanding that they have to do special measures for this group. These were somewhat monitored by the media, I think quite well understood also by the public at the time. Uh, there was a bit of talk about um, um, uh, having to deal with the fallout of these measures after the COVID pandemic. But then suddenly, once it all boiled over, everybody stopped talking about what happened. And uh, I know that there is one person who tries and tried to get to the bottom of this topic. And I'm very happy that this person is sitting next to me and is also present in this virtual room. It's uh, Dr. Svetlush Rasurova, the director of, uh, of MIRI. So um, uh, without further ado, I would like to ask Svetlusha to present her findings uh, in this topic. Uh, and then uh, I will ask a few questions and also leave uh, time for your questions so you can prepare those. Svetlusha, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, once again, uh, hello to everyone. I'm very happy that I can see 
so many colleagues from different parts of the world and also uh, 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 that I can present uh, findings from my two research uh, uh, on the quarantining Roma settlements during the COVID-19 pandemic in Slovakia. So recent pandemic has uh, disproportionately affected Roma people, amplifying pre-existing poverty, uh, exclusion and discrimination. And it has even exposed them more to the vulnerabilities than before. But instead of uh, uh, recognizing these uh, vulnerabilities, Slovakia has deployed heavily securitized responses towards the marginalized Roma communities, which resulted in the militarized quarantines uh, of the six these communities in the first wave of COVID-19 pandemic. And throughout the second wave of uh, uh, pandemic, Slovakia was one of the very few EU member states, if not the only, that again resorted to closing uh, houses, apartment buildings, streets, and entire settlements. Uh, so today, in my first, uh, in the first part of this presentation, I will explain to you uh, how it has uh, um, all, uh, how this happened, who securitized uh, Roma communities, how and why, and then I will, uh, in the second part, present uh, the. Uh, uh, serious shortcomings of these official measures that, as was already said, specifically targeted these communities. So before I dive in, uh, I will just give you a very brief overview of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on Roma and their fundamental rights. And then I will explain the terminology that, that they use and uh, also describe the situation in which these communities uh, live. Uh, Oh, very briefly, I will mention my theoretical and methodological framework, uh, so not to uh, um, spend too much time on that. Uh, as Mirsad said in the introduction, uh, the um, uh, studies were already published, well, one on securitization in 2022, and on uh, the, the analysis of the official uh, acts, it was published uh, last year in 2023 uh, by Nelson uh, Mandela University Press. And I saw also uh, the uh, uh, chancellor of that university here present with us. So it is really an honor um, to have you here. So then I will... Uh, um, uh, mention only a few key points from these two studies, and for each part of the presentation, I will present conclusions. As I was mentioning before, pandemic has uh, negatively affected all areas of people's life, and different states and public health authorities have adopted uh, different measures, ranging from their recommendations to the legally binding ones. But not all citizens. Uh, were um, affected by this pandemic uh, to the same extent or treated equally by authorities. Uh, Roma communities have faced not only negative effects of this crisis, but also disproportionate enforcement of the measures taken to contain the virus in their settlements. And one of those, the, those measures were the quarantines. European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights has uh, recorded uh, serious problems with equal access to rights for Roma, but other minorities as well. And at the beginning of the pandemic uh, in Slovakia, the then, the then uh, public defender of rights uh, has uh, drawn attention to the very problematic nature of closing entire settlements. And she has analyzed already mentioned military quarantines in the first uh, way. Uh, and uh, came to the conclusion that uh, the fundamental rights and freedoms of all these uh, people closed here, which was more than 6,000 people, were violated. And in a similar manner, last year, uh, current ombudsman has uh, brought a statement about one quarantine from the second wave uh, of Roma settlement Galeoka, where he stated exactly the same, that the, the rights of these close people were violated. And uh, he was actually uh, scrutinizing the 
submission that I have filed uh, with his office. So if you are interested more in this, we can talk uh, in a Q&A section. Uh, um, a legal scholar, Roman Lissina, and also employee of the Ombudsman office, which I think that he is also present today with us. So thank you also for coming. Um, uh, he has analyzed uh, one decree of the, that quarantine marginalized Roma community in the second wave, and he has compared the practices of the uh, health authorities in Slovakia to the fast and furious right. And my research supports these findings and even goes beyond uh, illustrating how authorities have targeted these communities selectively and collectively. And why was this such a huge uh, problem? I will explain when I will talk a bit more about life circumstances in which they live. But before, just to briefly uh, emphasize that I use the term Roma as defined by Council of Europe. And you all the time here, I'm speaking about marginalized Roma communities. There are different definitions of this concept and various state institutions define them differently. But what is a, a common definition, a definitional marker uh, of this concept is that refers to the uh, communities that live uh, spatially segregated with intergenerational poverty present. As Abel already mentioned, uh, most Roma, not all, but many Roma in Slovakia live in uh, difficult uh, conditions of stru structural discrimination, segregation, and extreme poverty. Uh, as I was just saying now that uh, many of them live uh, spatially segregated. There have been recorded cases of uh, segregation in uh, um, medical environment, environments, in uh, maternity wards. In the past, Roma women were even exposed to forced sterilization, and recently European Commission has filed a lawsuit against Slovakia at the EU Court for Justice uh, because of the segregation of Roma children in educational settings. I cannot tell you the exact number how, how many Roma are in Slovakia, but according to the Atlas of Roma Communities, uh, and the, the publication uh, which analyzes this data and was uh, uh, was edited by my dear colleague uh, Abel Rava sitting here next to me. Uh, oh, there are more than 800 municipalities with more than 1,100 concentrations. Just to be fair and to show that I studied the good methodology of this atlas, not all concentrations are Roma settlements. Yeah, but uh, in this concentration, uh, Roma live. Uh, when it comes to the life conditions, they are very harsh. Uh, 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 many of these uh, people do not have access to drinking water, sanitation, and during the COVID-19 pandemic was almost next to impossible for them to isolate uh, because they live in overcrowded uh, dwellings. And also they did not have uh, um, access to disinfection uh, products. So in my first study, I was looking who, how, and why, and what kind of issues, and for whom securitized these communities, with what kind of result, and under what kind of conditions. Uh, I, I am political scientist, so all the topics that I study, I approach from political science perspective, and I uh, always use a new institutionalization, uh, institutionalism as an approach and securitization as an analytical framework I use in this study. Uh, and also I deployed qualitative research design, including a case study, elite interviews, and qualitative content analysis. Here suffice only to say, uh, what securitization is, and it is a more extreme version of politicization. It, it is a process when some issues are uh, 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 um, um, approached in terms of security and labeled as existential threat. And I have collected data by different methods, but I just only want to show you here uh, the uh, from elite interviews, the list of respondents. So I tried to speak with the uh, respondents who were in a relevant way involved in uh, adopting these measures, uh, implementing them, and evaluating them. And 
if you look at it, I spoke with 26 respondents. Here I see some name that <laughs> sounds familiar. Uh, so, um, and I'm very grateful for all the respondents that they were willing to talk to me. Just to contextualize how everything has started, immediately after the first case was recorded, uh, authorities have adopted very strict measures, uh, uh, emergency situation, then state of emergency took place. But what is important uh, here to say that new government took office. And already then, the key actors that were working with these Roma communities, such as the then plenipotentiary for Roma communities, again, sitting here next to me, Abel Ravels, healthy regions, uh, ombudsman uh, office, NGO organization, they all were asking government to prepare some plan how to deal with the uh, with the, uh, this virus in these communities. And what has the then uh, prime minister done, he, uh, Igor Matovic, he has invited his uh, um, colleague from his party, Peter Polak, who is a member of European Parliament and Roma himself to come uh, and to be a member of permanent crisis committee and to oversee the testing in these communities and mitigation. Also government adopted the resolution and start testing uh, returnees uh, to these communities. And then only five days after testing started, boom, they put it into the quarantine, six marginalized Roma communities, as I said before, more than 6,000 people with assistance of police and army. So how this happened so fast and why? In my study, I explained that it was the then Prime Minister Igor Matovic who started with the securitization narrative, labeling Roma as a public health threat and creating divide, uh, divides between uh, us and them. And when he was pointing this, his colleague to that uh, committee, he said, I quote, when those people get out there infected, we will all pay for it, end of quote. And then he was explaining how this can, uh, you know, uh, uh, burst uh, on a large scale in uh, these communities and how one person in community can infect it 20 while in, in majority is one to one. And then he said that uh, if, uh, when this uh, happens, all the hospitals in the area will be occupied and we are done. Also, Central Crisis Committee has uh, identified similar threats as the Prime Minister, but what is here important is that they were worried uh, or they were anticipating that uh, the members of these communities won't comply with the measures at place. Uh, here I would uh, uh, just like to go back to the governmental resolution. Uh, that I uh, spoke before that was adopted. Already this document has uh, envisaged a quarantine of entire settlements if there more than 10% of all tested people would be positive. I have prepared for you a map to see where the communities were closed. Uh, three in Krompahi, one in Bistrani, two in Jahra, I'm missing here one marker and they, they are situated in the east of Slovakia. And I have also one more quarantine that happened actually before, but it was not uh, issued official document for this. So I analyzed this case uh, uh, in another paper. And here you can see the photos, how the quarantines looked like. So this decision about the, about the quarantine was done by regional hygienists, and she has uh, reasoned her decision by the current epidemiological situation and increased incidence of COVID-19, among others. And she said this is necessary measure to uh, protect public health. But she didn't want to uh, share the data that she was acting upon. And before these militarized quarantines, Central Crisis Committee had a meeting. And here on the picture, you can see the prime minister who also refused to, to uh, tell the exact number of positively tested, quote, so as not to incite range, as a quote. And he was actually uh, persuading uh, closed uh, uh, members of these communities that they should not see this as unfriendly act, but as an act of protecting them. And uh, next days he was comparing the uh, um, uh, corona in the settlements uh, to the ticking bomb and again, justifying the, the reason the, and hoping that uh, people will understand why they had to do it. Uh, I was very 
fortunate uh, during my research to acquire the data from the testing. And here you can see that before the quarantines in Krompahi were tested positively eight cases, Bistrani nine, Jehra 31, and then they were retesting them till the end of the May. Quarantine lasted from a few weeks, uh, few weeks differently in every settlement. I can show you that later. Uh, and uh, this was less than 10% of tested. And also, uh, it is a bit strange that after closure, every nobody was afterwards positive. We can also talk about this later. Yet, chief hygienist was also uh, trying to justify these measures publicly, and he was uh, saying that they were considering first to quarantine only people positively tested, but uh, after taking into account local conditions and customs, they decided to close them all. But this was in opposition what one of my respondents regional, um, uh, health, uh, from regional health authority has told to me. These respondents said that they never even considered individual quarantine for marginalized Roma communities. Oh, so when somebody makes securitization move, that doesn't mean that securitization happens. Uh, securitization uh, take place uh, when the audience accept some issues as securitized. And in this case, the respondents coming from uh, the um, government and uh, uh, of authorities have ac uh, accepted the securitization and they were defending the measure. They were saying it was like unpopular, unpleasant, but necessary, effective. And as one respondent has said, only thanks to the closure that was there, it did not spread among other residents. On the other side, not everybody gave consent to these uh, securitization moves, and those were the respondents from uh, academia, uh, NGO sector, practitioners, advocates, and they found these quarantines very problematic from the human rights-based approach that and they recognized the violation of rights that was happening here. So let me conclude. At the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the key actors working with Roma communities identified them as a vulnerable group, but it was the prime minister, politician, who uh, portrayed them as a public health threat. And he made the securitization moves, and uh, uh, it was done, uh, the securitization from top down. It, it had a hierarchical um, um, uh, nature, and it included coordinative discourse among uh, policymakers. And you can see that these moves got formal support from Permanent Crisis Committee, Central Crisis Committee, Chief Hygienist, Regional Hygienist, Police, and Armed Forces. So instead of uh, ap applying humanitarian approach and uh, taking into account um, human rights of these people, securitization took place in Slovakia. So, and uh, military quarantines you raise uh, very serious questions about limitations and even violation of these uh, uh, fundamental rights uh, of, of the um, members of these groups. What is even more problematic that these kind of measures were discriminative and disproportionate, but only Roma faced them, not the rest. And uh, probably explanation for, is, for this is the fear that yes, the actors were really afraid what will happen if the corona outbreaks in the uh, settlements, but also they were afraid that the Roma will um, uh, infect the wide majority. And also another probable explanation is the presence of systemic uh, discrimination and institutional racism that the authorities, even when they wanted to help these communities, they could not avoid. Um, so what we have learned from the first wave uh, uh, I will uh, illustrate on the quote from one of my respondent, respondents. So this respondent has said, I quote, close or not to close. No one had a plan for it. No one had a motive. No one was in this situation what to do next. I think in this situation, having learned this, I believe that other measures would have been probably taken. And now let's see what has happened in the second wave of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, regional offices of public health have adopted 57 decrees that quarantine these communities. 
and these measures affected ten thousands of people. So now I'm over quickly ju over jumping to my uh, second research. So what I did, I collected these acts. I treated each of these acts, 58 acts I have as a research case. And I was analyzing here who adopted the act, or what kind of uh, measure was adopted, what, what kind of legal basis, and uh, other things. And I was scrutinizing them in terms of legality, proportionality, necessity, and temporariness. So you can see my database. It is really uh, messy. I can come back later to that. But let me... Um, finish. So these are the documents that I analyzed here. So when it comes to the first case, uh, the measure from the first wave, uh, it lacked a legal basis. Uh, regional hygienists can uh, adopt the measure to forbid the contact of uh, some population with the rest, but not during the um, uh, state of emergency or when it comes to the public health threat of the second degree. And as I said uh, at, a bit earlier, it was uh, emergency state um, in place at that time. Uh, so the uh, regional hygienist over, uh, uh, overstepped its competencies, and that's why the act was illegal. Also, there were other problems with this act when it comes to the accessibility. I will just say that it was um, published on the website of the regional office of public health. And when it comes to the uh, other cases from the second wave. Uh, here, 57 cases that I have analyzed, they had the legal basis, uh, all the, uh, was the same for all. But again, what, what changed here is that uh, after this uh, illegal <laughs> measures taken in the first wave, the legislator would actually, what has done uh, it extended the powers to Ministry of Health, Public Health Authority, and Regional Offices of Public Health, and in the way that they could have other uh, measures to the extent and for the time necessary uh, in uh, case of public uh, health threat, but uh, without any, uh, they did not ha had to um, um, fulfill some requirements, you know, so based on their own discretion, they could uh, adopt these kind of measures and public health authorities and regional uh, also. But what has happened that then the, um, the novelization of the law uh, canceled some clauses and even a constitutional court has revoked some, some uh, um, uh, clauses and the, the constitution court has argued that uh, you cannot delegate uh, uh, by law powers to executive to uh, limit fundamental rights, that this is not in accordance with the principles of legality, legitimacy, and therefore is unconstitutional. Uh, so, uh, and also that uh, public health authority, regional offices of public health uh, could have not ha have these uh, powers for the same reasons. So the, uh, when it comes to the legality of all these 57 uh, cases, they ordered, uh, they were saying that they act upon one law, they ordered a measure that the municipalities and cities should control the, con should control the quarantine measures. And based on the law that they were acting uh, upon, they did not have this competence. They could not entrust somebody else with this kind of, um, uh, with the supervision of the compliance of the measures ordered, which is very strange, and I will uh, maybe in Q and A explain uh, more about this. Uh, also, uh, the um, decrees did not include uh, any justifications for these uh, um, uh, measures, and uh, as uh, the uh, here present uh, legal scholar said, if they don't, in the case of absence of the justification, they are unreviewable. They said that this was because due to the COVID-19 disease, but nothing else. And all the all the um, measures were revoked by arbitrary decisions of regional offices of public health. So I'm concluding. So uh, in the first case, 
the uh, act did not have legal basis, did, was not based uh, on the constitution or laws, the procedures were not followed in the all the other cases uh, was symptomatic for this decrease, legal incoherence, uh, no justification or termination dates. Yes, quarantine is the standard measure for the protection of public health, but it cannot be done without any constraints. It always has to be legal, proportionate, temporary, and open and transparent. Cannot discriminate uh, or be disproportionate towards minorities. And yes, uh, Slovakia's EU member state had the primary competence to protect public health, but even uh, the most restrictive measures uh, have to be in uh, in compliance with the obligations of the Slovakia in uh, terms of uh, human and minority rights. So last thing, uh, in Slo the, the biggest problem, uh, what has happened here, that the military is quarantined, seriously limited or violated fundamental rights and uh, freedoms of, uh, of members of marginalized Roma communities. And this has happened in an formally inclusive national context of the EU member state. And those rights guaranteed um, uh, were not implemented for everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Svetlusha, for, for those opening remarks. Um, I have a few questions of my own, but please do prepare. Uh, so participants, please do prepare your questions. I will leave the floor open to you very, very soon. My first question to you, uh, maybe with a comment also, that it is relatively obvious that the measures uh, chosen by the Slovak government are very, very, very problematic. Let me add uh, data from uh, just very briefly from, from another research. The Ministry of Finances uh, found that while um, uh, death, uh, the, the increase of death among the majority population during COVID was 21%, among the marginalized Roma communities it was 44%, which is an insanely high number. Obviously, you can say that Roma communities already had uh, uh, health issues and the lower uh, the general public health level, but still, uh, very likely quarantization contributed um, uh, to this number. And that is just to mention one of them. So, okay, these are problematic measures. You think, do you think they are problematic because it's problematic already to target Roma communities with, with specific measures? Or you think it's legitimate to target with them with those measures, but the measures chosen were not right? Uh, I, I... Of course, uh, it is problematic because they targeted only uh, marginalized Roma communities selectively. Uh, so uh, that is problematic, and also the 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 way uh, and the measures themselves, the nature of those measures, I find also uh, um, uh, not uh, not only they were illegal. You know, so if some some measures are illegal, they cannot be right or correct. So uh, just to contextualize the. We did not know how many uh, positives are in some buildings where the wide majority lives. So uh, I, if you lived in a building and you didn't know how many cases, there was no police on, or army that forbade everybody to go out. So what, what has happened in practice is that they closed hermeneutically, as I said, everybody positively tested and negatively tested together. And if you take into account the difficult life situation of these people, not that they contributed to the prevention of the spread of coronavirus, but I even claim in my study, they exposed these people to the um, um, virus. And you mentioned the numbers of the mortality rate. So this I found very problematic. And uh, maybe I will stop just here for a second. I can come back. Uh, if we have another question from the audience. We do. Actually, Mirsad already has his hand up, so please go on. Yeah, uh, well, that's an excellent point that uh, I will make, um, that uh, maybe some of these communities do need some sort of special policies because of their vulnerability to begin with, but then the question becomes exactly what kind of policies could be done but from your presentation, uh, we can also see how silence is dangerous, uh, how silence is dangerous, particularly to, for these uh, type of marginalized minorities. Um, 
Um, and we can see also how interesting it is when you mentioned that things didn't improve after the realization that after first closures, um, you know, that, that some things was, was done wrong. And we see that with the second wave, <clears throat> things were even more uh, expanded. The same type of approach was more expanded. So I'm, I'm really puzzled by this, like looking from the United States and enjoying this focus on, on preventing tyranny of the majority in the United States, even constitutionally and all that stuff. To what extent this could be generalized, right? Uh, I'm, you know, I am from Europe, and I do know how Roma population is marginalized, not only in Slovakia, but throughout. So do you have any information on how the Roma population was treated in other countries? I understand that you're a political scientist, and you're afraid to essentially talk about cases where you don't have a data, but um, it, it's just fascinating to see the silence about the issue. So what was happening in the rest of Europe uh, with this type of marginalized communities? Yeah, thank you, Mirsad, for uh, questions. But first, uh, let me go back to the first, what you were saying, that uh, uh, this, uh, what I wanted to show to you here is that when once securitization starts, it's very difficult to stop it. That why is dangerous to label minorities as a threat, to portray them like that. Uh, then uh, secondly, uh, just going uh, back to those quarantines, during the second wave, when they were again closing these communities as on a treadmill, at the same time, there were other measures in place, like saying what to do when you are positive, uh, uh, tested, when you, when you are a contact and so on. There was a measure, so all the other people had to obey to measure to that, but they went even beyond that and uh, put in the special measures on Roma. And even beside this, there was also another measure which allowed it uh, exceptions from the isolation and quarantine. Even when you were positively tested, you could have gone to shop, to doctor, and so on. But Roma communities, even when they were negative, not that they, they, they were physically held close. So you understand, they need a special treatment, but not like this special, that for them, every, for us, we had some measures and they had this kind of illegal. So, uh, and when it comes to the other cases, I was looking into those cases that uh, actually deployed quarantine. So Slovakia was not only in the first wave, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Greece, they were also closing Roma communities, uh, Portugal. So, and they, they had different measures, for example, like controlling the excess to and uh, out from the communities. Uh, sometimes they close uh, entire communities. The 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 um, secondary literature that I read, even there were a few cases and they decided to close all. Then, for example, a European Roma Rights Center has uh, documented the cases of the human rights abuses in 12 states during the state emergency. So yes, that was happening also. Uh, they closed the nomad camp in Italy, in Bol Moldavia. In uh, I know that we have here also uh, participants from uh, Macedonia, they uh, also, uh, there was a problem, they did not want to allow some Roma uh, family to uh, to enter the country. So yes, uh, but I was looking into the quarantines, but uh, uh, the extent, what what was done, it is unique in, in Slovakia. Thank you, Svetlusha. Uh... Uh, let me return to the research itself because I find it quite fascinating um, uh, for for the well, you know there is a type of research in Slovakia and there's a type of adherence to methodology but I feel that your research is a bit out of the box when it comes to the Slovak scene and talking to senior uh, political people responsible for some of the decisions is definitely a, a route that not many researchers in Slovakia would take uh, how did you find the methodology? Was it difficult to fix these interviews? Did the interviews make any sense to you? 
and well, I, I know I'm giving three questions, but very close to each other. Did people start to rationalize their decisions that they made during this period? And how did you tackle that during the whole process of, well, working with the data that you gathered from the interviews? Uh, thank you so much, Abel, for asking this, because I didn't have time to speak about the uh, methods itself. It was not a pre-mediated question, by the way, so. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, first of all, I would want to say that um, uh, I, I deployed elite interviews, semi-structures with open-ended questions, and uh, the um, um, every method has limitations. So, of course, uh, the, the, there is a, a dangerousity to the validity of the collected data that, that the uh, uh respondents do not have to remember exactly what has happened or they can inten intentionally misrepresent the um event so uh to uh, to to avoid this um um disadvantage in the validity i uh, deployed uh, triangulation strategies so all the data from interviews i analyzed uh, in the perspective of other empirical data gathered, and I had uh, asked information from all state uh, and public health authorities. So everybody hates me now in Slovakia because I sent so many requests on the pre access um, um, law to information. And also, I uh, reviewed all this data. Uh, um, against the uh, journalistic articles. So, and what you were asking, um, uh, what were they saying? Uh, first of all, I was very surprised that they wanted to speak to me. This was shocking because I was doing earlier research on Slovak diaspora policies and nobody wanted to talk to me and that was not so controversial. And this was like very um, um, hot topic at the moment. And I was doing the interview, when was that happening? And I was surprised with responsiveness. Um, the responsiveness rate for my uh, interviews was 70%, which is for this kind of high profile um, respondents quite uh, uh, quite uh, good. And um, I was um, I was shocked by their honesty. So they were really talking to me uh, how they felt. And at the end, I had the impression that they, as you said, uh, did they wanted to justify. I had the impression that they want to justify the measures not in front of me, but in front of themselves, because many of these authorities that were directly uh, uh, included in decision making process about quarantines, they were always ending with the saying, please don't think that I'm a racist. I'm really not a racist. You know, it was necessary. So uh, uh, this I uh, got got a lot. So. But as I'm saying, I think this will, I don't think that in uh, future research, I, I, this will be possible to actually approach these people and that uh, they, they would be open about their motives be behind uh, decision, decision taken. And then actually I continued with my research and then I was sending them further questions based on the free access information uh, about the second wave. Uh, to regional offices of public health, and there was already not such a good response rate. Some sent me data, some not. But what I have noticed that all the answers were the same in yes. form. So like copy paste, just different data, but all the structure, everything. And then uh, in the after Corona was almost uh, finished, I was just uh, checking the facts. You know, I was uh, calling them by uh, by phone or emails double checking and asking them things. And then then it was already um, not such a good um, responsiveness and they were really mm, sensitive and uh, they were even, uh, some of them were aggressive. So mm -hmm. they were like angry, but you know, it was again, we have to take context into account. The war in Ukraine started uh, after pandemic, everybody felt, you know, uh, with a shake hand, a uh, lot of crisis we had here, but then they become uh, nervous about like, why you have to do this research? Who cares about that? You know, so, uh, and that was already uh, over, but I think that after they realized I started to write about it, already published something, so then it was already not so 
you know, they were not so willing to share uh, transparently uh, the the information with me. Uh, thank you, Svetlusha, for the answer. I have one more methodological question to you, and it is about uh, the second uh, part of your research. The first part was mostly based on the interviews that we just discussed at, at length. The second part of your research was more based on the analysis of all the official documents that uh, were the basis of the quarantines locally. Well, you're, you made the statement or the claim that these were mostly focused at Roma communities. But if you if you read the text of uh, of those measures, the word Roma is not really mentioned there. Uh, so how do you know that these were Roma communities? Obviously, I'm provoking. We all know that these are Roma communities. But what's your methodology for knowing that these are Roma communities? Yeah, thank you, Abel. Of course, this is very important because this was one of the uh, just to go back uh, when, uh, one of the threats that I have faced after everything was already done, database and uh, paper was prepared. So uh, some uh, people from regional office of, of public health said that they will sue me if I publish this research because I'm claiming that they targeted uh, Roma or marginalized Roma communities and they have never used the term Roma in their measures so it's they never closed the roma they have this kind of they closed a positive people who were positive this is their uh, argumentation but how i know uh at the beginning i said that i spent few days in one quarantine uh during the second wave of covid 19 pandemic in Glaoka. i was there and i uh, saw that it is not going it is not okay what they are doing there and i wanted to file a petition to ombudsman and then i had to open the measure how how i actually started to create database and when i was searching for this measure um i uh, i found it and then i was seeing that there are also a lot of measures that they're closing uh, some kind of uh, geographic places you know with the uh, with not so no you know big cities or so that is not so familiar and i was looking like what kind of places are these so what they did they did not say that we are closing roma but they wrote exactly the numbers of the houses buildings or streets so they mm, located them geospatially and as i was looking to that i said okay i have to check other measures so i went through all the measures and i have never done research on roma communities but I noticed that these are those marginalized Roma communities based because in other measures, you didn't have this kind of uh, geographic specification. And then I opened Atlas of Roma Communities and uh, uh, I st started to reference what they ordered, whom to close. And, uh, and then I matched the geographic location with the concentration uh, from that Atlas. So. And uh, since uh, I never worked with this, then I uh, called Abel Ravas, who is, <laughs> who is from Planet Potentiary and has worked a lot with this atlas. And I asked him if he can see, check my state database and check if this is right. And okay, that was definitely not where the question was going, but <laughs> I find it very, very important that you are working with data that actually goes beyond the official text of the government statement. So that 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 I found to be very uh, important. Okay, maybe Abel, how 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 did you kind of how did you respond when you saw uh, Dr. Surovel's findings? Well, I was not surprised. So uh, it it as Svetlusha mentioned it that let me just switch off the spotlight while you are uh, working like that. Yes. So, so I was not surprised by, by Svetlusha's findings. Uh, the, Svetlusha mentioned between the lines that, uh, I was planning potentially as, uh, the COVID started, but, uh, I was uh, removed from the office by the incoming government almost immediately in part because I didn't accept the measures that, that were being proposed. And I never accepted them really because I, I, I understood them to be very problematic. And I'm happy that uh, Svetlusha put in the research so that now we can, um, you know, state with a complete uh, uh, confidence uh, that uh, the measures were directly targeting Roma communities. Um, uh, these were measures that were systematic uh, and these were measures that were discriminatory. And I think that this research gives a good um, uh, well, point of departure for further investigations of maybe not even just research type 
which I think are, are necessary because research is important, but, uh, but it's, it's not everything. And let me come to Svetlusha with, with, with a question that follows up on this, uh, which is that how was uh, the response um, uh, to your publications in Slovakia? Uh, well, let's start with, you know, the, the general public. Uh, was there any kind of reflection? Is this something that the people are talking about? I understand that you didn't publish this in tabloids, uh, but in, you know, scientific journals and uh, mostly in English. But was there any kind of research coming back to you? What was the feedback? Thank you so much. But uh, before I answer this uh, uh, question, uh, uh, I'm sharing with all of you the database. So how I uh, knew that these are marginalized Roma communities, you can see for yourself. So uh, here, here I uh, populated uh, this column, affected persons, exact wording as specified in the act. So you can see, so the regional hygienist said, all person residing in street Hornatska. And then I open this data here with asterisk. You are from the Atlas of Roma communities. And here you can see that the, there is a concentration with the same name. So street Hornatska. Yeah. So they did not say Roma, but in Atlas, uh, there is this concentration. And then you see uh, all person residing in street Drushtjana. You know, they are match. They are uh, almost not all are perfect match, uh, something I had to still pick up the phone, you know, investigate uh, how and what, but most of the affected persons uh, um, um, indicated in decrease uh, ref referred uh, to uh, concentration from Atlas of Roma communities. In other words, they themselves used Atlas of Roma communities to close this uh, communication. So it was other way around, yeah? And I have to say there was one or two measures where they said Roma settlement explicitly, and there were a few um, uh, decrees that I analyzed that did not say Roma communities. They said actually whole town, but after investigating, they said whole municipality, but only Roma were close, not white white people there. So, yeah, but usually, uh, usually it is straightforward. So you can see also here which streets so you see here they exactly they put in the numbers of the buildings the numbers of the houses you know you see the residents of residential units number 20 30 and 32 orecho dvor in atlas aroma community orecho dvor so you know and other measures uh, were not uh, uh, um, so exact <laughs> when it comes to geographical location of the people who should stay in isolation and quarantine. So let's let's go back to the question, yes. Svetlusha, if you don't mind about the response so that yes. I can then yes. open the floor for yes. other questions. Yes, thank you. So besides publishing one uh, scientific article and a chapter in a book, I also published a reportage from the quarantine that I was in. I will show you here. I have... Uh, Photos. So I spent three days uh, uh, in this uh, Roma community of Gleoka documenting this quarantine. I got invitation actually from one respondent who was uh, director of one organization and she called me and said come to make a, a write a good practice article. And I was doubtful about that. But anyway, I went there. And what I found, it was not good practice, but again, one uh, of uh, illegal quarantine. And uh, the uh, people living here were uh, begging me to help them to write, uh, to write uh, in the media. They wanted to, they were disappointed that nobody came to see them, to speak with them from media. You know, and then I, I was thinking how to approach this. I decided I will file a petition to the Ombudsman. And then I said, OK, I will write a reportage, which I wrote. It was published. But then the problem started because then uh, I have to say not directly. Nobody told to me anything, but the the organization who was executing these measures uh, uh, wanted this reportage to be retracted. And um, since the chief of the editor of the journal and also the other editor are knowledgeable about the Roma communities and how the situation is there. They did not do it, but there were big pressures 
to be to withdraw this uh, article and also what they did then they were uh, bad mouthed me so writing to other people who were sharing this uh, uh, reportage uh, that not to do it and they were like having some kind of uh, personal insults but what was funny that the the reason why they uh, asked to be retracted they said uh, <laughs> that because i am uh, from serbia and that all the serbs are liars and i'm not even the serb and it was funny to see that the people who worked with the most vulnerable socially excluded communities are racist themselves that they use uh, this kind of type of argument to attack because the editor said uh, what is not true give me the sentence give me the paragraph give me the, what factually is not true and they could not say it so what they did actually they said like she's from serbia you cannot trust the serbs and but another thing was also interesting that the human rights activists were actually angry on me after publishing this reportage and they were uh, upset that it was too too soft they wanted something stronger because that reportage was balanced i did not put any uh, any of my thoughts there you know so i just documented who said what uh, negative positive things uh but they they did the, the human rights activists uh, uh, did not find this like a good approach they said that i should have been uh, more uh, um, you know uh, i don't know um vocal about what is happening there Thank you, Svetlusha. Uh, now I, I invite you all to raise your hands if you have any questions. You can also use the chat, just as Mirsad used to ask if they could have been using the census data. I can take that one very quickly. I'm pretty sure they did not use the census data when uh, looking at uh, possible places to quarantine, and that's because the census was 10 years old at that point and is dramatically uh, misrepresenting where Roma people live in Slovakia actually just a very small fraction of Roma in Slovakia declare as such in uh, in the census and it's also in a non-systematic way so so that would be not a very good use of data we do think that they actually use the atlas uh, database which is a state database by the way so it's it's prepared by the state uh, from uh, Euro European funds and the database is available uh, at the Planet Potentials website but also at, of course my own NGO's website at the Matthias Bell uh, Institute in a different version. All right, so the floor, floor is really open. Please do raise your hands and please do ask uh, questions uh, from Svetlusha if you have any. Okay, while they are thinking, let me let me target you with another one, Svetlusha. Um, uh, I asked you about some kind of a public response. But was there any kind of uh, government response, and not just only to your research, but also to well, just what happened in the field? So let me phrase this question in another way: Is is there some kind of a change in the thinking of the Slovak government uh, towards the issue of uh, quarantines? Uh, if there was another uh, pandemic incoming, would we be seeing the same measures? Um, and if not, why not? And what would change? Thank you, Abel. Uh, uh, it's difficult to answer. I hope we won't see any more these kind of measures because they were unprecedented, as I said, and to violate uh, rights for almost 50,000 people, it's, uh, you know, um, uh, not only pro problematic, but as my one of my respondents said, it's scandalous. But uh, I did not have so many um, um feedbacks from the governmental officials only from the office of the planet potentiary view and uh, they were more um kind of uh, uh watching what, what i'm writing what i'm saying and they were trying to again make some positions that they were also against that and you know uh, i don't even know how to assess this uh, what what was coming from them because on one side uh, I clearly saw that they were um, against this kind of approach but on the other hand they were giving me uh, argumentation of why it has has happened and you know it in, in in some sense it looked like they would be defending the measures so uh, yeah 
it is I, I don't know even I was I don't know <laughs> in in the one sentence how to answer it because it was not so clear um, what was actually uh, the point of that feedback on my work from them. I could not read it good, you know, but uh, uh, of course uh, I, I can say um, as anecdote that now in a parliament is prepared draft, uh, no, the, the declaration, resolution about the violation of uh, rights of Roma in Slovakia. And actually the party from which was the prime minister main securitizing actor and who actually uh, gave a green light to all these quarantines, his party is proposing this resolution. So. On one side, during the pandemic, they were closing them illegally, and nowadays they fight for Roma rights. So, but what uh, if I can say from a researcher point, what was uh, surprising to me to see that those uh, actors who were working with marginalized Roma communities and helping them, that actually they were the main executors in the practice, and that they went with it. And one respondent was saying, like, but you know, we are humanitarians, so we don't look if there are some violation of rights or not. We cannot look at that. But it's not that they did not look at that, because when I was in this quarantine in Gleoka, the people working from them were actually lying to Roma communities. You know, they were saying, like, the, for example, the I was there present and I have recorded. The person comes and says, uh, why I cannot go out? I'm negative. Why you didn't give me paper that I'm negative? Why everybody, even positive Slovaks, can go to the shop? Why we cannot? And they were, they were saying to them, like, you were negative two weeks ago. You know, after testing, one minute after testing, you can be positive. And this is this was not okay. And these were the people working with them. So I found very shocking uh, uh, about this. Who were those supporting structure, structures of this injustice. And that is sad because these are the people I, I think that the Roma believe the most and put their hopes in it. So yeah, I was, it's it's not a very happy uh, you know answer, but 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 I get it. Uh, actually we have a, a question coming from uh, Roman Lisina, uh, who is one of the other uh, people who are working with this topic or have worked with this topic after after the pandemic. So Roman, please do take the floor. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I have actually one question, uh, and that is uh, how strong or what role did uh, one, one kind of an argument play in justifying these, these measures uh, when you talked with all the uh, stakeholders? And that is uh, many times when dealing with these kind of cases, uh, many, many of the respondents uh, were talking about all the humanitarian aid that the Roma communities were uh, provided with, uh, starting from food, uh, water, uh, sanitation, and so on. Um, and um, in general, I, I really appreciate your, your research because it has more of a conceptual view um, and um, uh, it, it shows the, the whole uh, scope of, of, the, of the measures. Um, but uh, many of these people uh, pointing at the humanitarian aid might have been struck with the with the symptom of not seeing the forest because of the trees. Um, so, so my question is how important or how, how many times did the stakeholders pointed at all the uh, humanitarian aid uh, provided to Romania communities that was supposed to justify the, the measure itself? Right. Or how, how important role did this, did this play? Yeah. Their response. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lisina. Once again, I appreciate that you, you took your time. Uh, well, uh, only those coming from uh, a practice uh, who were involved in uh, providing humanitarian aid uh, use this argument, not the others. For example, um, uh, respondents coming from NGOs, being Roma themselves, they were critical about this. So uh, yes, I know that even in uh, when I submitted the petition and in the statement of one Muslim, he wrote that how you know they were arguing uh, in that Glayoka, the local city uh, uh, 
people coming from the city, they were saying like we closed them, but they did not need it to leave out because we brought them food and water. But, uh, you know, so if you give to people to uh, eat and a drink, is this okay to uh, on a force hold them somewhere to violate their rights? I don't think so. But this was the, some people, as I'm saying, they had this kind of uh, justification, but I, again, I think more in front of themselves than the others, you know, to justify like, okay, we, we help them. But I went, for example, I went to marginalized Roma communities I, and I did the focus groups uh, uh, there and interviews. And those people, for example, had completely negative opinions about this aid. They were saying that they were, first of all, at first days it was difficult, they didn't have it. Then they got the food that they didn't like to eat. Then they were complaining they didn't get the meat. Then they were complaining that there were cases when uh, somebody overtook of this uh, humanitarian aid and was selling the products for higher price than it was supposed to be. And, you know, so, uh, I'm finishing uh, that uh, article uh, where I am giving the voice for uh, to the people who were closed, and then I will uh, sh share more and speak. But for for uh, what I heard from those people, they were not so uh, they were not praising humanitarian uh, workers. Yeah, uh, let me just come in with one more comment before I, I yield the floor to Mr. Nemet, who has a question and. My comment is that I visited several of the quarantine settlements myself. I'm not going to name uh, the settlement, but uh, I, I personally witnessed that uh, the settlement was, was closed with minimal to no aid uh, to the people. Uh, they, there were problems with drug addicts not receiving either drugs or medication or health. These were like two weeks to three weeks of quarantine, which, which caused problems. There was trouble with people who were living as, you know, day, on day-to-day -day wages, including uh, sex workers who had no money and therefore they couldn't even send one to the shops. They had uh, people with uh, very serious health problems that were not being taken care of. So maybe in the first wave when you had uh, state-run quarantines, that was a bit different than in the second wave where the, the local municipalities were taking an active part in, in the processing and the responses and, and, and the quality of the quarantine were very different uh, dependent on, on the quality of work done by the local authorities themselves. But I think it's a great question about uh, the humanitarian aspect and how it influenced uh, how many people saw the quarantines. And I, I liked how Roman put it. So thanks for that question. Uh, can, uh, I just, uh, can I just jump in? Sorry, Abel. And Peter Nemeth, just give me one second because I will forget. Just going to back to this uh, humanitarian aid, what the respondents were telling to me that why more quarantines didn't happen or why they were not longer because they uh, were beyond their power to maintain this. You know, there was not any more people who could uh, uh, aid them, help them in a humanitarian way, and it was expensive. So after they found out that that costs money for, uh, creates costs for municipalities uh, in terms of uh, not financially, but also they had a, uh, uh, they had to um, allocate resources, human resources to do it, then they realized this is not an, anymore, uh, you know, they cannot continue in this way and then they uh, canceled quarantines. Okay, thank you and thanks Peter for your patience. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for that. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thanks for invitation. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Izor Govanova and Roma Institute, uh, former plenipotentiary in the previous years. And I just, uh, you, uh, Abel, you fully answer. I do not have a question. I have just a comment. But uh, after your uh, comment or, or addings, uh, it's not necessary from my side to to add something more because I am fully, uh, fully agree with you what you said. I've been present personally. Uh, as an organization, as as a, as, as a human being uh, during a COVID period uh, uh, around that settlements uh, with or without quarantine. And uh, I'm completely uh, agree with what you said as a comment. And that means that uh, humanitarian aid definitely was not sufficient in that times with a lot of problematic areas and with a lot of uh, almost traumatic situations uh, happening all around in that time. Uh, one comment which I would like to 
to underline is that uh, this situation really extremely uh, clarify how it is uh, easily possible to identify a group of the people behind of the on some fact or it doesn't matter whether it is ethnic or social uh, uh, exclusion or whatever else and how it's possible to manipulate uh, standard rules and regulations if uh, you do not have a, a precious plan for for implementation and uh, participation of the military during that uh, quarantine uh, uh, services or let's say as quarantines uh, as itself uh, was a significant milestone for me uh, how how it is uh, how, how it cross all the lines not just the human rights lines but also legal lines in Slovakia and it was never correctly explained with uh, some kind of argumentation you used in your uh, presentation and thank you very much for that it was very nice uh, to hear that that uh, really we need a strict rules and regulations crisis plans uh, where uh, the vulnerable groups of the people which are really the most uh, in, in the most in hardest position or in, in the biggest dangers where, where we need need to count uh, count uh, especially on that group of the people because from my perspectives uh, the Roma community during pandemic was really a tester for a general community how to act what to do uh, how we could manage some kind of the group uh, how we could use the military services how we could uh, I'm not even talking about the testing which was not a voluntary one but they were really forced to be tested etc etc how we could manage the humanitarian crisis etc so so really this situation remind us a lot that we need to have very strict uh, legal framework legal regulations uh, laws and uh, crisis plans for such kind of situation and uh, unfortunately it show also that uh, uh, humanitarily the state or the district or institutions were not capable uh, after the decision to close the, to close the settlements to they were not capable to to support them with the, with the appropriate uh, humanitarian aid all included which you mentioned abel Sorry for that. I do not have a question. It was just really a comment from the field. And no, thank no, you for the. No need to be sorry. It was a great, uh, great comment. And maybe Svetlusha would like to react to that too. Yeah, uh, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, you, you summarize uh, a lot of problems that I didn't have time to touch upon. But just what last, what you said. Uh, with the problems during the quarantines. Uh, in the quarantine, and Abel was also mentioning, not only that they were not prepared, but uh, the, the worst what has happened, so they closed them to protect their uh, right to health, and then these people do not ex access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. In the uh, Gleuka where I was, people could not get the doctors to prescribe them medicine, and why? Because many of them do not have uh, health insurance or they did not visit the doctors for many years, you know? And this was even in the Ombudsman statement, it was there confirmed. So when they needed something, because it was not that the doctor was coming to the settlements, they were closed there. And, you know, it is a bit uh, uh, beyond the, the decency to expect that the, these people uh, can get medicine being uh, living somewhere on the outskirts or outside of the municipality and, and you know, so, a huge problem so not only their um, human rights you know to residency and movers movement was were violated but also right to life right to health as i'm saying they were exposed more to the to the virus but also the other rights was 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 abel mentioning right to work nobody's emphasizing these people are working in 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 informal economy even uh, the formal and formal and also yeah. uh, right to education 70% of the uh, children from poor marginalized Roma community, according to Edu Roma, did not have access during the first 
uh, wave of COVID-19 pandemic to education, distance, because Slovakia also uh, uh, deployed distance learning at the time. There's, so many, many... Sorry, there's actually also a court decision already that uh, the state did not do enough to ensure that uh, children had, ex had access to education during the COVID pandemic. It's, uh, it's a ruling for a, a certain Roma community in Eastern Slovakia, Jarovnice. Uh, there is a, a single case that the court has already ruled for, but I understand that if they were to be going to other cases, the ruling would be much the same. Uh, the right to several different uh, uh, types of, uh, well, you know, to, 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 to work, to education, to health and all that were absolutely ignored by by the pandemic uh, decisions and before before uh, just going to uh, other questions let's, let me finish because uh, i did not have time to uh, talk about this so as you peter said like we have to do better but uh, there are constitutional legal uh, uh, rules in place but they were not acting upon this. So if the state authority does not respect their own laws, how we can expect that the people will comply? You know, this I, as a political scientist, I find this very problematic and uh, uh, authorities have to understand that. You know, this is, it's, it, it is uh, state power have to act only um, uh, within the laws. And we didn't have that. And also for these people, right to equality was violated, right to anti-discrimination. So we have, that is what I said. So all those rights that de jure exist mm -hmm. were not recognized in practice and only for Roma and not Roma like in general, but only for those most vulnerable ones. And those are marginalized Roma communities. And you also, Peter mentioned like, how this, how was this possible? And uh, when they ask me, how was this possible? And I open always that my the, uh, database and then you can clearly see where are the concentrations. It was possible only because they are spatially uh, segregated because it was possible to come from one side of the settlement and uh, the other and just to close them. Because if they would live integrated, you cannot do this kind of measure. And that's why we have to, uh, do much uh, more uh, to end this segregation. So unfortunately, it's my moderator's duty to, to say that we are entering the last 10 minutes of the discussion. We have two hands up. So let me bring in Mirsad and then also Peter. If anyone else has questions or comments, please do raise your hands now. Mirsad, the floor is yours. Uh, please, Peter, maybe have a follow up. So Peter, go ahead and then I can ask after. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And just very shortly, I am fully agree with you what you said, and I am really happy that such kind of uh, scientific research uh, happened because we need the data, we need the base evidence. And uh, for me, this meeting have a extreme perspective for a future because we learn how even the constitutional rights, legal frameworks, or the legal rules could be obeyed or or delayed or 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 somehow turn around in a critical, very critical situation. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not apologizing that. I'm absolutely agree with you what you said, but in, in a moment where we were not able to apply any kind of uh, crisis rules or crisis management, of course, these things happen. And this what is strongly reminding me that, especially in a critical situations, we, of course, we means as a state, but the state is never so flexible as the other, as a uh, educational or, or institutional or NGOs organizations. So we need to be prepared that this, what we saw and what we really lived for two years could happen. And we need to, to be prepared to give the crisis plan to any competent institution which were lost in that time and which really do not have any idea how to how to how to approximate the rule of law in daily reality and that was the biggest problem i, I remember very well the discussions it, it was a discussion around 10 or days or two weeks whether the health uh, regional health uh, institutions uh, has the right or do not have a right to to proclaim the quarantine and and there is no legal framework i know that i agree with you but we need to be prepared for that and as a conclusion for me of that COVID situation was that we need to focus especially for the uh, people in a very vulnerable situation in poverty, excluded, segregated. Yes, because we could, we could even, we could close Petr Žalka, which is very 
typical part of Bratislava, but uh, but it was non-Roma uh, inhabitants living there, which have enough skills to protect themselves. While these people did not have enough capacity, skills, proficiency, experience, or whoever, whatever else to, to defend themselves. And that's, this is also part of the problem. But sorry for being too long, and, but yes, it was just a comment, not a question again. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Krie, Kriestorac uh, for, for the floor. Mirsan, okay, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was just to say, uh, you know, out of the respect for my uh, basically home institution and our home country of Slovakia, which I love more and more every day, and I respect it very much, and I hope one day to maybe even live in Slovakia. I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be very reserved and all this stuff, out of the respect and and uh, out of love. I'm Slav after all too, and uh, our, my anthem was Hey Slovatsi, right? So um, I love it. But uh, Peter brought a, an amazingly important question. Not only that things fall apart across the lines when military got involved in stuff, but it is also, I have to call my colleagues, mm -hmm. what is the role of academia? Mm -hmm. I am coming from the United States and there is an onslaught, global onslaught on academia, essentially to silence academia in various ways and uh, essentially sideline, sideline all this type of work that Svetlusha had done um, so that, you know, conversation can be basically carried by the media, which media is, we all know, starting from sometimes in 2002, you know, with that whole story of, of embedding media with the government officials and stuff, it basically it, it diminished the importance of it in a democracy. So now it's strange, but the academia becomes perhaps the last passion of the rule of law. The academia becomes the last passion of the you know, highlighting issues like this. And so to me, I, I had Svetlusha in my human rights class that I teach here at FIU, which is one of the largest universities in the country. And, and I was moved by the comments from the students I got. They were shocked by what they heard. But at the same time, they never heard this in the media. And so, again, it highlights that not only that the society crumbles across the line of all this how you say official institutions, but our colleagues, us, we should be asking ourselves why we are silent. And so my you know, question, let's kind of pose a question, considering your own health, Svetlusha, why did you decide to do this? I mean, we were all afraid at that time, but, and I know, you know, that, you know, you do have this type of, uh, how you say, considerations too, for many <laughs> reasons. Why did you decide to go into the camps and, and study this Roma population? Maybe because you were a minority in Serbia too, right? It's funny, like I, we talked about it before, how in Serbia you're Slovak, in Slovak you're Serbian. I have the same experiences. But uh, Peter, excellent point. And that was essentially also what I was thinking, thinking how the whole thing fell apart, not just... Uh, not just the legal structures, not just the law enforcement structures, but we also as academia uh, are, are missing in actions. I hope you guys see what is happening in America and understanding the importance of academia is only increasing every day. Thank yeah. you. Sorry again for taking long. No, thank you, Peter, for the comment and also Mirsa for the comment and question. And let's make this the final round for you, Svetlana. Yeah. Let me add just one more small question to it, which is what's next for you in this topic? Uh, are you planning any more activities here? And, you know, are you are you going into an activist role as well as an academic role by trying to promote this? What's what's next? And final remark that you might have here today. Thank you so much for all three of you. So going what Peter said, uh, uh, about this, uh, there are no procedures, you know, how to do this during the crisis, but actually we have, we have the rules, what to do in the crisis situations, they were just not uh, uh, abating to them. And instead of these authorities to act upon the law that specifically said who should do what in the times of crisis, they do something completely illegitimate and illegal and then even extending they extend their powers and i have to say that uh, uh, the constitutional court was very precise saying that you cannot executive cannot have the power to limit fundamental rights this belongs only to the legislature 
you know so and um, uh, what Mirsad was saying uh, why I decided I uh, first of all I didn't know how big research will be that it is it is lasting four years and it's still not at the end I just want you to analyze in the first way I didn't have a uh, I could not even anticipate what will happen uh, in the second wave on larger scale and why I went to the quarantine uh, because I got invi invitation and I was really curious and of course I was scared because at that time we did not have vaccine and I'm immunocompromised uh, uh, um, uh, patient and of course I was afraid but once when I was there and I heard these stories of the people and I saw what kind of injustice they are going through my fear uh, just resolved and you know uh, I, I tried to do my best as a researcher as a, somebody who came to document to help them and uh, going to Abel's question, what's next? So besides doing research and uh, publishing it, fin finishing still uh, the study uh, from uh, um, uh, where I record dissenting voices from, from uh, Roma themselves about the quarantines, I also try to make some change uh, um, going to different international forums where I um, uh, speak about this problem and uh, I, the, the goal is to get some kind of apology maybe from the uh, government of Slovakia towards Roma and to um, uh, maybe even remedies for them. So th th these are the plans for the future. But uh, uh, of course, the, the goal, me as a, a researcher and also as a member of minority, is uh, inclusive future for all of us. Oh, that's that's some lovely last words for from you today, Svetlusha. Very, very nice. And thank you for not just your presentation today, but for all the work that you have done over the years in this topic. And I hope uh, we can present some more of it uh, in the future. Uh, thank you all for being in a, and for your questions and also for trusting me to guide you through today's event. And I yield the floor back to Mirisat for maybe some final remarks. Uh, well, no, I, uh, I have no final remarks. It was amazing and interesting presentation. Uh, we appreciate all of you coming and sharing this uh, time with us. We promise we'll bring you more. I think we have rights with Russia next. Uh, the conversation is on Nigeria, right? And so I hope you all find it uh, interesting and join us. And I hope that you will um, spread the word about the good work that uh, Miri is doing. Miri, based in Slovakia, in Bratislava, Central European country. Thank you again and have a wonderful day, everybody.